first of all, um, yeah, welcome to the talk about home energy savings without breaking the bank. Um, yeah, that's where it's all about. And of course, before going on about saving energy, um, I think the first question we have to answer that we might want to find out where does my energy go? Uh, we all pay for it, but where does it go? Uh, that's the most important question we have to ask before we can start saving, because where to save when you don't know where it goes? Well, if we're looking at heating and for, um, you know, to go by the biggest common denominator, I will assume that the heating is done uh, with gas. Um, and if we look at the average British home, um, it's, uh, it's most of it goes to space heating. That's keeping your home warm, basically. Then there is a good second is hot water by some distance. And then there is cooking, um, assuming you have a gas cooker. Of course, um, there are homes that do not use gas, but oil. And there's homes that use uh, electric for, um, for hot water or cooking or both. Uh, but just going by the averages, there's the pie diagram. And most of it, for an average British home, um, goes into space heating, 9,000 units of energy, kilowatt hours. The average bill is um, in, I think, 2022 prices. Sorry about that. 630 pounds. And then a good second is uh, hot water, 2,600 units of energy, kilowatt hours, 182 pounds. And then cooking is actually, um, you know, quite distant third, um, if you look at it. So um, monthly meter readings, it's not too much work. Um, or, you know, you can retrieve them back through your bills. Uh, that will actually tell you quite a lot. Um, this is my house in 2016. Uh, I had the luxury of um, solar hot water then, but even when this is all done, um, this is the the, the gas use. Uh, you can tell, you can see basically three distinct regions. There's the summer where only gas is used for cooking. Um, there's the winter, of course, when most gas is used for heating. And there's the shoulder seasons where most gas is used for, for hot water. Of course, in the winter months, the gas is also used for hot water, but that is a relatively um, minor amount. Well, less than the heating, I should say. And if you look at this, um, you know, in, in early 2022 prices, if you translate it, uh, cooking for a month is about 250. And that's about comparable to the UK average of hot water for a week, uh, which is, well, you know, about two thirds of the UK average for winter heating for a day. So the biggest savings are to be had for, uh, in, in the space heating department and then hot water is a, is a, is a good second. Um, cooking on gas, starving yourself, having cold meals, I'm not sure. It, it can save something, uh, but not very much. The picture changes somewhat if you have an electric oven uh, because those, of course, electricity is a lot more expensive per unit energy than, than gas is. I'll come back to that later. So actually monthly meter readings are a good way of, of estimating where the, your, uh, your, your gas bill is, uh, is going, where your money is going. Um, for electricity, this is a bit more difficult. Of course, you can keep monthly readings, but there are so many users, it's difficult to say, oh, that's hot water, that's space heating. It's also not very seasonal. Um, a lot of people now have smart meters, they show your current usage, the cost of that usage, and they have some memory so you can look back off the last few days or the last week or the last month. Um, and if you don't have one, um, I, I'm told that Cambridge Carbon Footprint, uh, I know they have these meters and hopefully they can be put on a loan scheme so you can see your instant uh, power use um, and see what your, uh, what your consumption and cost is per, per hour. Um, Actually, that's why my interest in home energy started because I bought one of these devices about 10 years ago. Um, I was reading a book and indeed the thing stood at like 400 watts consumption. And I thought to myself, like, why does it take 400 watts for me to read a book? Uh, so instead of reading the book, uh, I went around my house chasing the, uh, the consumers and trying to switch them off. Um, and I only returned to my book when the, uh, the consumption was below 150. Uh, but then of course it was too late to read the book anyway. Never mind. Um, so actually you can take this a bit further. And um, for me, it gave me a lot of insight about where my where the, the, the use of my electricity is going. If you take this further and you try to get your home to zero, if you have a smart meter or one of these OWL devices, 
or as some equivalent, um, that is quite instructive because you really have to look hard for those last few watts. Um, it is surprisingly hard. And once you've got to zero, um, then you see your consumption track up when you switch it all back on, um, if you are still inclined to do so, uh, because you might decide that, you know, having this, uh, having this thing um, switched on, whatever it is, might not be so necessary at all. Or, you know, I can put it on a timer switch so it doesn't use energy when it's actually not in use itself. If you want to look at um, how a specific device, uh, how much it consumes, there are these, um, these socket monitors uh, you can have, you can, you can buy these. And I think- Yeah, I've got it now. All right, <laughs> sorry. Um, there are a few of those, um, some councils have them on loan. They're not very expensive. And those can sort of track the consumption of a device or look at how much the device uses in a full day, for example. If you go um, further, yeah, the, the smart meter, unfortunately, doesn't not tell you uh, all, uh, all the things it does like a gas meter does. Uh, because, you know, we've got things that are on for a long time. Uh, they are perhaps not very powerful, but they can leach electricity, such as television, lightings, computers. Um, just to give you an example, watching television for two hours is about eight pence. But then there's also, we tend to concentrate on the very powerful appliances that are actually on for a short amount of time. Uh, the kettle, the washing machine, and maybe less so the vacuum cleaner. Boiling a full kettle, for example, is five pence. Um, you know, in the same ballpark as watching TV for two hours, but vacuuming for 30 minutes is 20 pence. Um, yeah, it, it's worth sort of keeping this in mind when uh, when trying to make savings. Um, and then there is the um, the benchmark. You you It's difficult to guess, like, how are you doing? Am I on the bottom end of the scale or am I much too high in my energy use? Um, there it is useful to um, have a look at your energy performance certificate, the EPC. It should come with every house, um, and it is um, an assessment of the cost of running your home and its CO2 footprint. It's not perfect, I have to say. It's based on many assumptions and averaging, and you know, uh, hardly any house is is the same as any other house. But it's worth comparing your energy bills against the EPC predictions because it gives you a ballpark. Uh, you know, if it's twice as high, uh, something must be wrong. Um, if it's twice as low, you're doing pretty well. It also, the EPC includes advice on how to improve the efficiency of your home. And it's worth looking at that. It might be a bit uh, subject to fashions. Um, mine, for example, from uh, 10 years ago, uh, we sort of really recommended to install a wind turbine as David Cameron did at the time. Uh, that's not so fashionable anymore. Now it's solar panels. Um, so, you know, it's, it, there is, there is, you know, improved thinking goes into these things. Uh, and it's, again, I have to note that electricity is three times as expensive as gas for a kilowatt hour of energy unit. Um, it means that uh, the EPC sometimes recommends to step away from electricity and go to gas without really reducing the energy consumption because it is just lots cheaper and it's cost-based, not per se energy-based. Um, well, um, of course, you're a you're a selected sample of people who are interested in this, but I can imagine that saving energy doesn't really sound like much fun. Um, it's a lot of hassle. You have to go crawling around your house trying to switch things off for a few pennies per day. But on the other hand, you can ask yourself, what is the cost of doing nothing? Um, you know, what if I just continue as is? What will my future self be paying? Um, unfortunately, energy costs, certainly in the recent years, do not seem to be um, going two ways, but only one way, and it's it's not down, unfortunately. Um, and also, you can look at energy saving measures as things you do once, but you profit forever. And some of these uh, pay for themselves in less than one winter, mostly for heating and insulation. That's what Martin will tell you more about. In um, this, all sort of boils down to doing it sooner is better. And um, if you add all of these measures up. Uh, we're talking pounds and not pennies, and then it becomes really worthwhile. Um, the di most difficult ones, I have to admit, are the ones that need change of habits, although uh, it gets less painful when you do this gradually uh, instead of giving your hot showers up completely, for example. Um, I'll start with the most attractive ones, which are actually the zero cost home improvements. Um, and the first one is the boiler. Um, 
condensing or most combi boilers are condensing boilers nowadays. They are very efficient, but only under the right conditions. If you treat them badly, have them on the wrong working point, they can use up to 10 to 15% more. And the key here is all in the, um, in the flow temperature setting. Uh, that is the temperature that the boiler delivers to the radiators. Um, it should be 65 or lower, um, but most boilers, if not all, are getting more efficient when you get this temperature down. So there's here's another game. Instead of um, trying to get your gas used to zero, which would be very cold indeed, um, there is a game where you can play in the winter, coming upcoming months, to see how low you can set the flow temperature when where it still works for your home. Um, can you go to 60? If it works at 60 on cold days, why not? It's not. It makes your boiler more efficient, um, and you know that that will save your gas in the end. Um, there's more uh, more in-depth explanation than I can give in a few minutes under the link on the slide. Um, I do have to remind you that if you don't have a combi boiler but you have a hot water cylinder, that these need a Legionella cycle to um, sort of let you survive the winter in the first place, so to speak. Um, if you're not sure about this, there should be a boiler technician coming around every year to service the boiler and uh, explain, uh, you know, let, let that person explain to you how to do it. They might say, um, please don't do this, don't touch it, um, but it's not them who pay the bills. They want you to have a warm home. They don't generally really care about efficiency or running, keeping your home warm at the lowest cost. That's your job. So if you ask that person to explain, some of them are very enthusiastic to do this, um, how to set the flow temperature, then you can start to experiment and see how low you can go, how efficient you can get your boiler to still keep your home warm. Um, more thoughts on heating. Um, if you're not home all day, then of course the obvious thing to do is to heat your home part of the day. But do allow for your heating system, give it time to get the house up to temperature. Don't uh, whack it up from 12 to 21 degrees in half an hour and expect it to do well, because most heating systems are less efficient when going full blast to heat a cold house quickly up to comfortable temperatures. Um, there is advice, and it's a bit controversial maybe, it works for some homes and it works for, doesn't work really well for others to heat certain groups of rooms less. Um, for example, the kitchen doesn't need to be very hot when you start cooking because loads of heat are produced uh, when you do that, when you uh, make your evening dinner, for example. Um, most people like the bedrooms a bit colder. Bedrooms are more or less grouped on one floor, so that would work well. Uh, but do remember that there's no real internal insulation between, uh, between rooms and also the, um, you know, the air can flow from one room to another quite freely. So if you have, you know, one cold room in the middle of six uh, very warm rooms, that really doesn't work out so well. Actually, it can sort of uh, make it worse. So think about, you know, uh, heat the first floor left less or heat the left side of the house less or things like that. Um, another sort of... Um, thing to do is to install thermostatic radiator valves if you have them or uh, dial them up to the correct setting so you limit the uh, the heat output from the radiators. Uh, there's no need to have them glowing when the room is actually warm. Um, the other, that's actually not strictly speaking a zero cost measure. Another very good zero cost measure that you could do is to borrow a thermal imaging camera. Uh, Cambridge Camera Footprint offers instructions and a camera loan scheme as under the link. Um, and I just we just found out in <laughs> the, the run through of the slides that South Cam's DC has a web page on this as well, but it points back to Cambridge Carbon Footprint, so why not go there immediately? Um, the other thing is uh, to go draft busting. Martin will tell you more about this. Um, wait for a windy day or when it's cold or both even. That's very good. Um, and don't think you can address them all on that evening or day. Uh, write them down, take pictures and address them as and when. Uh, and it was one of my favorite web links there for draft busters on, with very practical information on how to do this. Um, now swapping from the low cost home energy improvements uh, from, from the zero cost ones to the low cost ones, uh, boiler controls. Uh, controls can make a big difference, especially the combination of an, uh, a modern, as we call it, modulating condensing boiler with very old controls is a, is a very bad idea. Uh, things can run much more efficiently 
when you have a modern boiler with modern controls. For most controls, there's um, drop-in replacements are available. Uh, there's solutions for every budget. Uh, and of course, there's a, again, the advice to fit thermostatic radiator valves. Um, of course, on, if you can, all radiators except the one next to the thermostat. Um, then there's the hot water cylinder is an obvious candidate if you have one. Uh, these things bleed heat into the home basically all the time. Um, the, the cylinder could be put on a timer, especially if you um, use lots of hot water in the morning and the evening. There's no need to have the boiler keep the thing warm all day. Um, and adding a cylinder jacket saves between 30 pounds if you're on gas and 100 pounds or more if you're on electric per year. Um, and you don't even have to buy one because a sleeping bag or quilts will do. So if you were wondering where to store your sleeping bag uh, in, in, in the winter, this is your answer. And while you're doing that, while you're crawling around in the airing cupboard, please uh, buy some of that pipe insulation and put it around the pipes. Martin will take, talk more about how to do it in detail. Oh, there's a stray picture. There's low cost insulation. Um, that's also possible. There's radiator foils. Um, it is very low cost uh, and don't expect miracles, but it does help especially if you put it behind the radiators that are on a wall that faces the outside. And the thermal imaging picture is where you can see the heat coming off the radiator, but not the radiator itself because it has a foil installed. Um, the other thing is uh, loft insulation. There are grants available, especially now. Uh, VAT is low as well if you are not eligible for a grant, but I think the grant cover quite uh, a lot of people now. And also the same goes for a cavity wall insulation if you have uninsulated cavities. Um, it is higher cost than the than loft insulation or radiator foils, but it does pay for itself in one or two winters and is giving you lower heating costs in the winters after that. Again, there's grants available and also possibly for landlords. Um, so yeah, if you if you have added the insulation, put your hot water cylinder on a timer. Uh, you know, try to uh, get the flow temperature of a boiler down, but your gas bills are still getting silly. Um, then there is the more radical advice, um, but do think about this before you uh, embark on it. There's more information on the Cambridge Carbon Footprint website. It's linked at the bottom of the slide. Uh, you could turn down the heating to 12, 14 degrees at night, uh, half an hour before bedtime, or off completely if you dare. Um, if you have a hot water cylinder, it's worth seeing how long your hot water lasts if you only heat it once a day or um, over multiple days. Uh, you'd be surprised how long it lasts in some cases. Um, yeah, that already takes me to the end of the slides. I hope I haven't been talking too fast, um, but I hope I've given you ideas for actions um, to take action today. Well, it's getting a bit late, but maybe tomorrow then um, to start saving energy for the day after. Um, first of all, Find out where your energy goes just by taking meter readings. It doesn't have to be more difficult than that. Have a look at your EPC, see if it makes sense, see if it compared with your bills. Try to address energy use where you can and start with the biggest users, the boilers, the controls and the flow temperature. And then there's the low hanging fruit, radiator foils, hot water cylinder insulation if you have on or loft insulation. And then it comes down to changing habits maybe. and. Um, or more on insulation and the opportunities to um, to keep a healthy home while making it energy efficient is in uh, Martin's talk after this. And um, I think I'll stop here and pause for questions. Have you ever considered reducing the temperature for your um, for the actual hot water, not just the 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 flow temperature for the radiators? Um, yes, I mean, of course, I've got the luxury of solar hot water, so in the summer it gets really hot. Uh, but the same cylinder is run at uh, 50 degrees in the winter. It it doesn't fill the bath as quickly, uh, but it's still good enough for home use. Yeah. If you um if you got a combi, you usually have separate controls for the for the radiator hot water temperature and the taps hot water temperature. Um, so you can turn them both down. And and like Bart says. Um, if you turn down the hot water, um, then it will take longer to run your bath because it will mix in less cold, if you see what I mean. Um, at least you'll probably want to mix in less cold. 
Um, but apart from that, it's it should be quite good enough for most purposes. Um, so it is worth doing that as well because it will save energy. Um, I've also put a link in the chat for a Transition Cambridge web, web page, which has a lot of tips like this. Some of them, to, it says heat savings back, but it's actually got stuff about um, about appliances as well, but it's mainly about heat because as Bart says, that's where most of the, um, the heating is. Okay, we have a question. Yay. <laughs> what is the Legionella temperature for hot for and for how long? Um, I think it is sixty plus. Why is it sixty five? I'm not entirely sure. Getting a question and not knowing the answer. I think we um we better ask Google. But it's uh, it's at least sixty plus degrees. If I I can't keep my um hot water cylinder at uh, at fifty all winter, that would be very harmful. I think it's recommended to have it once a week above 60 i would recommend 65 because i'm not sure and it's better uh safe than sorry in this case mm. um it doesn't need to be long uh, these uh legionella bacteria die pretty quickly at uh, 65 degrees so it would be an hour or maybe two a bit less out of thought actually we have another a sort of a comment um i'd like to hear from this person it's somebody mm. called am lake um talking about the nest thermostat i've got a nest yeah well am lake am lake would you like to unmute and tell us why you why you didn't like it yeah hi can you hear me yes um so brilliant yeah i bought i bought a nest and i think it was about 250 pounds which is quite a chunk of money but but when i researched it i found that it was going to heat the house um as i was driving home and I just didn't think things like that. And it was going to um, not switch off till I'd left the house. And for me, I just felt I hadn't got control. And I would normally walk past the, the stat and just turn the stat off. I'm really, really rigid with stuff like this. So maybe mm. not for me. Um, I can maybe comment on that a little bit. The, the, the nest, um, it tries to learn about your habits, uh, mm -hmm. but it requires you to swing it up and down when you come in and go out um, sure. as far as i understood it you can always override it if you if you think you're always home on a thursday night and you go out as a exception and you turn it down it will stay down um i found it useful because we uh for example we normally are home all home on saturday so i had it set to uh keep the house warm all day but then when you go to town and you forget to turn it off it, when it hasn't seen a person for for an hour or so it shuts it down to the standby temperature so right. for me it worked um i i can imagine that it, the mileage might vary but uh it was much more advanced than our old uh controller which you had to manually uh, swing up and down when you would enter or leave the house it 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 depends i i've read a few articles where they argue that it was wasteful but they all went for a sort of a worst case scenario where the thing would have a very aggressive heating scheme and then um, you would not touch it uh, when, when you knew you were going away, for example, which I thought was a bit fanciful. Okay, you, bro you broke up a little bit there, but um, I, I, get the, I get the idea. It's still in the cellophane, so I just need to unwrap it and fit it and have a go, see what it's like. Yeah, I thought, it, I thought actually it was quite good, but maybe it was a big improvement for my old thermostat. Sure, yeah. Okay, thank you. So Hans, you had um, a comment about using electric blanket, which is a good trick. Do you want to explain yeah. that? Yeah, th there's not an awful lot to explain, to be honest, but uh, we moved to a small bungalow a couple of years ago, and uh, we found that uh, if we use our blanket, our electric blanket, we, uh, we don't really need to heat that room at all during the day, or during, no, at all, really. So just simply switch on the electric blankie 20 minutes before you go to bed on a cold day. And mm -hmm. um, that's it. Yeah. I think uh, Martin uh, has some words to say in his slides about that, where heat the human, not the home. That's that's one of the things you can do. Of course, in a bungalow, especially when the, um, when the, when the floor plan is a bit more spread out and the master bedroom sits at one end, uh, it, it is efficient not to heat that room. If it's in smack bang in the middle of your house, you might want to reconsider. Fair comment. Welcome to the talk. Um, 
what you'll find is uh, most of the things I am talking about in terms of low cost are clearly DIY options. And I'd like to just sort of um, say a little bit about my philosophy towards DIY, because I, I do a fair amount of it. And um, I generally class myself as a 95 percenter. And what I mean about that is whenever I do a project, I can't say I do it perfect. Um, but I'm okay with that because, you know, would I employ myself as a tradesman? Uh, no, I wouldn't because typically a tradesman is coming in and doing a, a high quality job every time. But the tradesman has the, um, the uh, joy of doing the same job again and again and again. What you're doing as a DIYer is you're learning how to do something, you're doing it, and then you're moving on to the next task you have. So, I don't beat myself up about being a 95 percenter. And the reason I say this to you is, is if you um, the sort of things that might stop you doing these things are either um, you just don't get around to it, which I can't do anything about that. Or it might just be confidence in what the um, the outcome might be. And the point I'd make about that is if you don't do it, you're a naught percenter. The job doesn't get done. So I'd rather be a 95 percenter um, and getting it done um, than not. So I just encourage you with if there's any of these things that I talk about today that are relevant to you, just get on and do it. And because what you'll do as well is you'll get more confident in jobs and you'll take on things that maybe earlier you wouldn't have thought about. So I just encourage you to um, uh, take up some of the things that I'm suggesting today. Okay, so what I'm going to look at, draft proofing, um, which tends to be the easier things to do, the lower cost things to do. I'm going to talk a bit about insulation, which can vary from low cost to um, uh, quite expensive, but can make a dramatic difference. And then I'm going to talk about ventilation, because that is important um, in terms of protecting the fabric of the house, but also protecting the fabric of you, your lungs, your health generally. Um, you want to make sure that uh, if you do seal your house, that there is good ventilation for those uh, for those reasons. OK, um, let's see, why am I not? OK, so start off with draft proofing. OK, um, typically, uh, if you're if you get to um, seal the drafts in your house, you can achieve something like a 15 percent increase in um, home energy, obviously more comfortable. You gain usable space. You start to use those rooms that maybe you would never go, uh, to, uh, you would avoid because they were cold. And also by uh, reducing the amount of energy you use, you're, um, you're helping uh, climate change, you're helping reduce climate change. OK, places to look for drafts. OK, the obvious ones, doors, windows, uh, maybe not so obvious, unused chimneys. Uh, I'll come on to talk a little bit about this in a, in a minute. Um, under sink, floor pipes, cables coming into the house or going out of the house. And again, I'll talk about this because these are two things that uh, um, shocked me in my house. Um, and from unheated rooms and under, the, under stair rooms, for instance, if you've got a cupboard under the stairs. Um, the reason for saying that is I would say that heat in your house in the wrong place is wasted heat. So I give the analogy that if you open your airing cupboard and a nice warm air uh, wafts out, um, in a way, that's wasted heat because you really want that warm air to be wafted around where you're sitting down in the lounge and not upstairs in a airing cupboard. Um, loft hatches as well. People tend to insulate their loft, but they don't necessarily think about the loft hatch. And the other point I'd make is this is a journey. So I put in here the drafts that you thought you'd already fixed uh, because you want to keep on coming back to these um, these drafts, the work you've done before, and just check it's still working. So uh, don't uh, just do it and leave it. Come back, um, you know, where it is, a year's time, two years' time or whatever, and just check that it's still working. OK, so finding the drafts. Gaps under skirting boards. I'll talk in a minute about methods for finding these drafts, where to look for them. Um, I talked about pipes uh, leading into the house, uh, bad mortar and bricks. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the sort of places where drafts can come into the house um, 
and sometimes it's uh, an issue about the actual um, material um, fun uh, fabric of the house itself um, and some of the areas therefore um, that you could look for. Okay, how do you test, how do you find these drafts? Well, there's, there's the easiest uh, uh, method is back of the hand or a cold, um, a wet hand against uh, uh, where you think a draft might be coming in and uh, a very sensitive part of the body therefore and in for catching drafts. But you can also use things like um, uh, thermal imaging cameras. We talked earlier about um, the, the fact you can borrow one. And if you want to get uh, reasonably sophisticated or if you have access to it, somebody came and offered to, uh, to do a pressure test in my house. And what they did there is put a, a big fan in the, the window, sucked the air out of the house, and we walked around the house seeing where the um, drafts were, were coming in. And that was quite an eye opener. Um, that led to the realization that many of the sources of drafts as I've discussed before um, applied to my house. And I thought my house was uh, fairly draft free in terms of I'd uh, spent a lot of time doing it. So um, that leads to things you to realize that places like electric sockets and the pipes under the sink and places like that can be a, a source of cold air coming into your house. Okay, so what can you what can you do about it when you found these um, uh, drafts? Well, let's start with uh, windows. Um, so, say seeing some obvious things here about you know you can get uh, adhesive foam strips and you can put them up in the frames. Um, what I would say, and you can get uh, brush strips uh, to put into um, uh, the uh, the sash windows. I have applied both of these over the last couple of years when I've been uh, renovating my windows and they have made a substantial difference and they're not that difficult. And what I would say as well is I found that I could move to a better technology. I was using to begin with just the rubber strips, but then I was told about a company called Mighton, which is uh, on the way to Saffron Walden which is probably the UK leader in terms of draft proofing windows and uh, items for windows. So I'd recommend that you look at them online and uh, see what they offer. The other thing that I did a, a while ago was do secondary glazing. Um, uh, I'd, years ago, I'd done it by a film that you can um, put across your, uh, your window. Um, this tends to be obviously fairly um, temporary because it can easily get damaged. Um, but then I moved to using um, uh, magnetic windows, the magnet glaze sort of thing. You'll see the picture uh, in the middle of the bottom, which is my front door, um, where there's a, a white strip, uh, metal strip put around it, and then the actual magnet is on the uh, perspex that apply to that. It's been a very good investment. Um, I've replaced it on our windows by uh, much higher quality um, gla uh, glazing, um, but we've kept it on the door windows, and it's a, a very good way of uh, of um, doing that. You can uh, you can do it through getting kits for magnet glaze, or there are companies um, that will where you can just actually um, buy the strips itself in a kit, and then you buy the um, uh, uh, the perspex from local suppliers. Again, if you're interested in that, do do let me know. Okay, doors. Again, foams between doors and uh, between the doors and the frames. Going to Kai's, they'll have um, items for doing this, for putting uh, strips along the bottom. Letter boxes, um, you can put a brush strip there. Keyholes, you can put a cover on. Um, and I'll show the sort of things here. I'll just pick out a couple of things here. Is um, the the rubber strip that you see in the top right hand side. Um, is is good, but you can get better quality ones that will last longer. And Mitens is a good source of that. Um, I'm not so keen on the brush strips for le uh, letter boxes because I do tend to find that those brushes sooner or later tend to get bent back, and you're back to getting a draft through there as well. So mm -hmm. I'm much keener on moving to a, a flat system to cover the letter box uh, rather than the brush strip uh, brush uh, system. And then for the keyholes, it's kind of a flat type of system as well, where it just um, goes down and covers it. I'll say something about brush strips. I've put brush strips in on the bottom of my doors, in internal doors in the house. 
Uh, we've lost Martin. Yes, I, of course, I can't uh, share Martin's experience, um, but this is um, mostly also from a um, older uh, Cambridge Carbon Footprint um, workshop. Skirting boards, the gap between the skirting boards can be nicely sealed with acrylic sealant. Um, in between floorboards, that wouldn't work so well. So there's draft text for that. Um, cracks in walls, you'll be surprised actually. Uh, we had a minor crack in the wall uh, and it is worth filling it up, especially external walls. Uh, pipes to the outside, expanding foam, uh, available in uh, all kinds of shops. Was that Martin coming back? Uh, fixing drafts again, uh, acrylic sealant under the um, skirting boards. Um, again, that was something that uh, surprised me. I'd insulated under my floors and thought, oh, I've fixed all of the gaps. Um, but I'd uh, 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 I'd left some gaps around under the skirting boards. And that's what the pressure test showed up. Uh, between floorboards, cracks in walls with fillers, um, pipes to the outside. Um, Again, I'd stress this, do look under your sinks and just see where the pipes are going and see test for drafts there because that's a great way for um, uh, uh, for uh, drafts to co uh, come into the house. Um, unused chimneys, um, you know, you can put uh, uh, bin bags or scrunched up paper or chimney sweep, uh, sheep up there. Um, also though, seal, uh, if you have a chimney that hasn't been used for a while and you think it's uh, well sealed, just look for gaps as well, because uh, our, some of our chimneys have been closed off. Um, but so uh, again, there were gaps where um, uh, drafts could come in. Um, OK, could you do the next slide, please? OK. Um, right now, within the living space that you're um, uh, you, you, that, that, that you, you spend most of your time, um, Heat in the wrong place, as I said, and at the wrong time is heat wasted. Um, loft insulation, hopefully all of you have got good insulation in the in the loft and you've got, you know, something of lot like of 200 to th uh, 300 mils. Uh, but what I'd say as well is try and minimize the storage area that uh, you use in the loft. Um, because and site the storage away from the edges of the, the um, uh, from being close to the roof, because what you're trying to do is get a good circulation in there as well to avoid condensation, which I'll come back to later. But the point with storage is um, don't just lay the storage down on the uh, joists of the loft. Uh, look at things like putting stilts on, which is shown in the uh, picture in the top middle there, um, where uh, by that can raise up the storage and therefore you can put insulation underneath. So um, that's a, a good step. Minimize it, keep it in the center. And oh, God, we've lost, we've lost you again, Martin. Okay. So yes, there's the, uh, there's the loft legs um, that will help lifting, get, still providing your, you, your loft with storage space while having the maximum amount of insulation there. I and can't see those loft legs. What are we looking at? Um, it's the black pillars underneath that sort of floating, um, okay. floating okay. board uh, in in the loft. There's it's black pillars there. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yes, I can. We can yeah, see that's mouse. that's the loft legs. Um, they are very funny things. Um, there is, of course, the loft hatch. As said, um, it's a source of drafts, and also it's mostly poorly insulated because in most cases it's just one layer of wood. It does compare a bit poorly with your 300 millimeters of uh, rock wall next to it. Um, again, I think I've talked about this as well. Insulate the hot water cylinder. Um, it does leak heat 24 hours a day if you have a cylinder. And that also does it in summer when you really don't want a hot bedroom. Um, and as you can see in the, in, the, in the picture there, there's beautifully lagged pipes with tape around the, the edges and the seams. So that makes also a very big difference, especially if you have already insulated your hot water cylinder. Um, so it's, it's all to manage the heat uh, in the living area and balancing it with comfort, um, you know, keeping it- Can, as... can, I, can I say something about, sorry. Um, yep. If you do it, when you're doing these, these pipes, the pipes from the boiler to the cylinder are the most important ones to insulate because they run really hot. And it's a real shame to have this water, this energy not going into the cylinder, especially in the summer. 
that's very true. Um, I would even go as far as when you are lagging these pipes anyway, you're taking the effort, also lag the cold ones because on uh, in the winter, the incoming water is like 10 degrees and that will attract condensation and it leaves uh, moisture where you don't want it. Um, lagging is very cheap and for cold water pipes, the thinnest lagging is already sufficient to uh, get it above the condensation point. Yes, yeah, so there's many options available and I must say I don't have too much experience with these. Um, there's the film. You um, you uh, put that on and then fix it in place with a, uh, a hairdryer or um, it's yeah, the purpose of the hairdryer is to is to smooth out the wrinkles. It shrinks yeah. the, the plastic, so it, it, you you do have to stick it around the edges first. Yeah, then um, it's temporary, effective, low cost, but fragile. Um, and you, I think you can do one or two seasons with it, and that's it. Most of the people take it away after the winter. Uh, the secondary glazing. Um, it reduces noise, which is also a nice effect. Um, it's fixed, uh, you know, uh, glued or screwed in place, but there's also magnetic versions, which you can take off and put back on again if you want. Um, of course, there's double glazing, but there's many different kinds of double glazing. Um, actually, I've got a few windows in my own home that, uh, you know, have the aluminium sides, which is a heat loss and has very old double glazing, some of it with condensation between the window panes. And actually, it is worth just getting new glazing panels for that uh, without ripping out the whole frame uh, the glazing panels you just have to measure what size they are and they're pretty cheap and the new ones are a lot more efficient than the old ones uh, definitely not zero cost measures but replacing a whole window is a lot more expensive than just replacing the glazing especially if you know exactly what the dimensions should be uh, Bob, can I just add in there that the the typical cost for secondary glazing is around about fifty pounds per square meter, and it can be done on casement windows, and it can also be done on sash windows as well. And there is a supplier of the acrylic sheeting that you use in uh, Cherry Hinton, and you can get the um, the uh, kits with the the metal strips and the magnetic strips from uh, on the internet from like Abel. Uh, magnet. So it's uh, it's something that is very DIY and pays back uh, typically within about five years. Um, you're very audible now, Martin. We're going to keep going. Sure, I'll keep going. I, I beg your pardon. Um, okay, floor insulation. We're obviously now moving into higher cost um, actions, um, but um, it's these are things that you can take one by one in your your house if you have, for instance suspended floors. I, I've got suspended floors throughout my house. I took them a room at a time and eventually after about uh, six or seven years um, had uh, completed all of the all of the um, rooms. It does mean that the room is out of uh, action for a while, but if you take it as part of the uh, typical desire to upgrade rooms, decorate rooms um, uh, every now and again, then as you do that, you can consider uh, suspend, uh, uh, insulating under the floor. The technology is moving forward. Um, what the first room I started with, if I went back and did it again, I'd do it much better. Um, one of the things I didn't realize is that it's not just a case of insulating under the floor, it's also sealing the gaps around the floor. You might remember I was talking about gaps under um, uh, skirting boards, but that is just uh, one indication of how if you leave gaps where, for instance, cables come up or pipes come up, um, you'll feel it in the room itself. So um, it's worth, uh, you, you You can get good uh, spe speciality tapes uh, for doing that. Yes, because of course, um, going around the sealing the gaps, there's indeed, as Martin says, specialist tapes, but there's also specialist coatings that can uh, seal the brickwork. Um, yeah, to go short, I think for these suspended floors, it's very important, like with the lofts, but then this is of course upside down. Um, we should avoid wind wash where the um, the wind blows through the insulation, but with the fabric, uh, you have to make sure that there is below floor ventilation is conserved. Um, so you have to sort of make sure that your, um, your air bricks uh, and whatever pipes you might have are still open and allow cold air to circulate under the insulation. And while you're at it, you can replace uh, floorboards or even put new ones in if you so like, if you so like to do so. Um, upgrade wiring and socket placement. 
you'd be surprised how many uh, how much wind comes through sockets uh, at the external wall. Uh, so it's very well worth uh, sealing those while you're doing these kind of disruptive works. Um, wall insulation, that is definitely not a low cost exercise. Um, it is very beneficial, uh, but you have to balance the cost and the disruption. Internal wall is very disruptive, very fiddly. It could be lower cost than external wall, uh, but both are major works. Um, and I have to say, not really in the low cost category. Um, what is very important, though, is when you Im improve your insulation, ventilation, a plan needs to be thought out and ventilation has to be improved in lockstep. We have to make sure we avoid condensation, which causes mold, poor health inside your home. Uh, that's not a thing we would recommend to anybody. Um, you also need to protect the building fabric. If there's something called interstitial condensation, where condensation happens inside the build elements, uh, that is detrimental to those build elements themselves, whether, of course, wood, you get rot, but also wet brickwork in winter might freeze and that cause um, the, the, the mortar to go. Um, of course, we need ventilationals to safely operate boilers, wood stoves and so on to not poison ourselves with um, carbon monoxide and to clear smells uh, inside the home and keep, uh, keep a fresh indoor climate and reduce infection risks. Um, so the upshot is to not block air bricks. They're intended uh, for ventilation. Um, of course, there's this sort of ventilation that is designed in the home to keep it healthy. And there's the infiltration, which is the undesired ventilation through cracks and holes and what have you. So don't block those uh, things that are put in place to design to get the uh, the design levels of ventilation in your home. Uh, trickle vents, extractor fans, and so on. Um, to reduce moisture in your home, it also comes down to habits. Avoid hanging the clothes to dry indoors. Um, use pan lids, simmer gently, not boil off liters of water in the evening. And uh, where needed, mostly kitchens and bathrooms, use extractor fans and trickle vents around the windows. Um, if you still have condensation, um, it's worth starting to investigate where it comes from. You'd be surprised how many people have uh, leaking pipes in their homes or maybe leaky gutters. Uh, the joints in plastic gutters are notorious. Uh, overflowing water butts, dumping lots of water close to your walls. Uh, rising damp could be an, uh, an issue or cold bridging where you have a sort of a, uh, a building element that is not well insulated, connects to the outside directly and then uh, through its coldness on the inside attracts a lot of condensation. Um, the um, CSE advice is to um, have a uh, the, the shock ventilation strategy where you open all your windows and your doors, if you like, for a through draft of five and ten minutes. It um, What it, this does is replenishes the air inside, but it's not long enough to really cool down the, the building fabric. So as soon as you close your windows again, You've got a house full of fresh air that is then quickly warmed up by all the teacups, books, floors, chairs, walls, ceilings that are still warm. Um, if you have a window open all night, you can notice that the, the window frames and the, uh, the reveal around it is very cold. That won't happen with this shock ventilation strategy. So installing ventilation, um, yes, of course, you attack, uh, you put ventilation in place where it's needed. Um, especially when, when you want to solve a problem. Um, we talked about loft insulation, that it needs good ventilation and these plastic bits that you can shift through the um, in between the, the roof membrane when you have a non-breathing membrane, those are a nice solution. And of course, fans uh, as appropriate, they need an isolation switch. So probably that's an electrician's job. Uh, there are fans that are reacting to say light switches for bathrooms. But there is also trickle vents that for bigger homes, of course, draw air through the property all the time. Um, it is a source of heat loss, but it preserves the indoor climate. And uh, last but not least, and unfortunately the slide is a bit mangled here, is that the NHS says that if you're under, under 65, healthy and active, you can safely have your home cooler than 18 degrees as long as you're comfortable. Um, so it comes down to basically warming yourself not more than uh, warming your home. Of course, there the obvious advice is layered clothing, warm socks and slippers because your temperature, your sense of temperature is, is mostly done with your wrists and ankles. Um, have a hot water bottle, bottle handy 
and there's of course there was a suggestion already of losing an electric blankets there's also electric clothes pads and of course you keep the keep the the furnace going by uh, by eating regularly and keeping uh, taking in enough fuel and that takes me to the end of martin's slides i just point out that um, cambridge carbon footprint maintains um, a directory of um, suppliers and installers for home, en home energy projects it's available on the um, cambridge carbon footprint website and that takes um uh, the names of suppliers installers who have been used by previous um, participants in the open eco homes program so it's certainly potentially useful to look at that fine well thanks very much for your participation um sorry about our technical difficulties but i think we managed to convey the message um, there's plenty you can get started on um, do follow up on the resources and uh, do the um, lower low cost things straight away if you um, can afford to do so why not get on with them straight away um, we'll bring our session to a conclusion and um, thank you very much for being with us this evening